Welcome to St. Procopius Abbey. My name is Abbot Austin Murphy, and I'm the superior of St. Procopius. I'm glad that so many of you could come tonight to hear this second talk in our series, the documents of the Second Vatican Council, or the documents, rather, of Vatican II. As you know, we're celebrating 50 years since the Second Vatican Council, and the aim of this lecture series is to give gifted speakers, have gifted speakers talk to us about the documents themselves in Vatican II. So the focus is on the text. So much is sometimes said about the council, but often the actual content of the council documents themselves are left unexplored or largely unknown. We are in this year of faith for the church. This lecture series is organized out of the faith that the Holy Spirit was at work in the council and that the council documents are guides for us as we as a church navigate a sometimes challenging future. I want to thank Dr. William Carroll, the president of Benedictine University. Benedictine University is a co-sponsor of this event, along with St. Procopius Abbey. I'd also like to thank Dr. Alicia Tate, who is the assistant to the president for mission at Benedictine University. She has worked with the Abbey in helping us to organize this event. Also, thanks to the monastic community of the Abbey for the work they've done in preparing. And a special thanks to Dolores Potterton, my secretary, who's done a lot of work in preparing for tonight. We are very honored to have as our speaker tonight the very Reverend Robert Barron. He is the current rector and president of the University of St. Mary of the Lake, better known as Mundelein Seminary. Of course, many know Father Barron as a Catholic author, speaker, and commentator. He has authored numerous books, and he is known as a scholar who is able to put some of the great Catholic thinkers, especially St. Thomas Aquinas, in conversation with contemporary thought and culture. He has founded Word on Fire Ministries, which uses the new media, internet, YouTube, and so on, as a tool to reach millions in order to draw them, as the website says, into or back to the Catholic faith. If you haven't had a chance to visit the website, wordonfire.org, it's worth doing so. For example, to find video clips of Father Barron commenting on various subjects, from movies, articles, books, to current events. Through Word on Fire Ministries, Father Barron created and hosted a 10-part documentary, Catholicism, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It has been a much appreciated exposition and presentation of the Catholic faith. He is working on another documentary entitled Catholicism, the New Evangelization, which I think is coming out at any moment. Oh, it's out. Excuse me. (laughs) We haven't gotten it yet. Okay. (laughs) Father Barron is, of course, a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago. He grew up, I believe, in Western Springs for the most part. And we are proud to say he is a graduate of our high school, Bennett Academy. (laughs) Now, he did spend his first year of high school at Fenwick Academy. And I mention that because the Dominican school, you can applaud if you're from Fenwick, too. But I believe you were first introduced to St. Thomas's thought there at that Dominican school, so give props there. He has received an MA from the Catholic University of America and a licentiate in sacred theology from Mundelein and a doctorate of sacred theology from the Institute Catholique. Father Barron will speak to us tonight on the document Gaudium et Spes. And after the talk, time permitting, we will entertain some questions. There's really a lot to say in introduction to Father Barron, but I won't go on. But simply to say, Father Barron, we thank you for joining us this evening, and we're glad to have you with us, and we look forward to your talk. Well, thank you, Father Abbott. That was very kind. And you're right. This is a um, very special place for me. I came to Bennett in 1974. I graduated in 1977. So after one year at Fenwick, I came here. And this place, I know, um, my parents would bring me out here occasionally on a Sunday to take in the full richness of the monastic liturgy. My courses at Bennett, I think of uh, Brother Guy who taught me uh, biology, uh, Father Ken who taught me Latin, the great Father John Churf who taught me Latin when he was 80 and I was 16. Father John died, I think, at at the age of 100 and something, didn't he? Uh, But wonderful models to me, the uh, Benedictine monks here. I had the privilege a couple of years ago to come back and do the monastic retreat, and I was able to, you know, reestablish contact with these great figures. 
Today was interesting. I was in the city for a meeting at about uh, 10 o'clock, then a second one on the south side of the city. Then I swung out to Indian Head Park to see my mother, who's 91, and we had a Subway sandwich together. And uh, in the course of the conversation, I told her I was, I was uh, in New York last weekend, and I was coming out here to give this talk, and I was doing something else. And she looked at me and said, Bobby, don't you think you're a little overexposed? <laughs> and, I couldn't help but I couldn't help but agree with her. You know, I probably am. But um, coming out here, actually moving, you know, west on uh, 55th Street, turning into Maple, uh, it's changed a little bit, but not all that dramatically. I was just flashing back so often to that bus trip I took every day out here to Bennett, where I played basketball and football, and just had a. It was a wonderful time in my life, and was very influential on my uh, sense of vocation. So I'm grateful, and maybe this talk could just be a very small token of gratitude to all that this place has meant to me, so thank you for having me. Thank you also for giving me the opportunity to give a talk on Gaudium et Spes, which compelled me to go back to this great document and really plow through it uh, in a prayerful way. Gaudium et Spes, you know, is probably the most controversial of the Vatican II documents, with the possible exception of Dignitatis Humanae. For some, for the proponents, Gaudium et Spes is the document of Vatican II. It's the canon within the canon. It's the interpretive lens through which you read the entire Vatican uh, documents. For the detractors of Gaudium et Spes, it's the source of a lot of mischief. That famously amorphous spirit of Vatican II that led to an accommodation with the modern world, many critics will blame Gaudium et Spes for that problem. I'll try to touch on some of these, uh, these points. Let me begin, though, with something very objective that no one can really debate. Gaudium et Spes is the longest of the Vatican II documents. In fact, it makes it the longest document in the history of the Church's magisterium. It clocks in at 37,000 words, which is a, a small book. And I think thereupon hangs a tale, by the way, of misinterpretation, because I think very few people, comparatively few people, actually have plowed through the entirety of this little book which means many people's impression of Gaudium et Spes is from quotes taken out of context or vague impressions or a few uh, lines. I think it repays a very serious and prayerful reading, which I think over these decades probably relatively few have done. What's the major complaint the critics have about Gaudium et Spes? Well, go back to one of the most prominent and earliest critics of um, Gaudium et Spes, namely Josef Ratzinger. Ratzinger even before it was published, and then right after it was published, was sharply critical of Gaudium et Spes for a kind of immanentism, a reduction of the supernatural to the natural, a tendency to read the kingdom of God purely in societal, cultural, and political terms. Ratzinger said famously, many parts of Gaudium et Spes are frankly Pelagian. Extraordinary for a future pope to be commenting on a conciliar statement and saying major parts of it are frankly heretical. But you know what's interesting is I reread a lot of the critics, not just Ratzinger, but Karl Rahner, in some ways the dean of, of uh, liberal Catholic theology. Rahner, too, was sharply critical of Gaudium et Spes, and for much the same reason. Rahner said it grossly understates the importance of sin, is far too optimistic about the human project. Many other critics now could be uh, brought forward. The history of the development of Gaudium et Spes is in itself interesting. Many would say it begins with John the 23rd's great calling of the council. Remember that famous scene when John stood next to a great globe? And he used for the first time the phrase lumen gentium, that the church is the light of the nations. The church must go out to the world. Well, there's the beginning, if you want, of the Gaudium et Spes um, impulse. For much of its prehistory, it was called Schema 13. And many of the leading figures at Vatican II contributed to it. The debates around Schema 13 are fascinating because it's like a battle of the titans. You have the greatest figures in 20th century Catholicism. Some of the people that contributed to Gaudium et Spes include Henri de Lubac, Yves Congar. Josef Ratzinger, despite his critiques, contributes to the council, to the statement. And of course, most famously, Karl Wojtyla. And I'll point out some places where Wojtyla had a decisive role to play. And look how important Gaudium et Spes becomes in the magisterium of John Paul II. So look at these, these titanic figures who contribute to this text, but they fought about it. Here's something else I love from Ratzinger's critique. He said, Gaudium et Spes is too French. It's coming from a German, of course. 
And what he probably meant was two Teilhardians. So remember, this is the high water mark of the influence of Teilhard de Chardin. And that sort of cultural optimism that you can find in Teilhard's writings finds its way into Gaudi Mitzpez. Ratzinger says, too French, it needs a good German influence, namely the influence of Luther, he said. Some of Luther's pessimism about the human uh, prospect, Ratzinger thought would benefit Gaudi Mitzpez. I'll come back to this, but it's interesting how the Council Fathers designated, as you know, four texts as constitutions. Sacrosanum Concilium, the one in the liturgy, is simply called the Constitution. Lumen Gentium and Dei Verbum are called dogmatic constitutions. Gaudium et Spes famously is called a pastoral constitution. So what does that mean? Well, clearly these four they thought were the most important. I think that's fair to say. They're constitutional. But this one is a pastoral constitution, leading some to say, well, yes, there are dogmatic elements within it, but also it's more evanescent because it's commenting upon the ever-changing cultural scene. And so room is left for legitimate criticism. I think that's probably a fair way to look at it. So even a Ratzinger and a Rahner and these major players quarreling with it, well, legitimate because it's a pastoral constitution, not a dogmatic constitution. I'll say a bit more about that. Here's a final comment about the, uh, uh, the statement in general. And I've contributed in the course of my uh, career to some committee-driven uh, statements you know, where you're trying to make a statement and you've got four or five people who are writing it together. Um, usually not a formula for uh, powerful writing. You know what I'm saying? When there's one great voice behind a text, you can sense it. When something is, is driven by a committee where, oh, I think you should say this, and oh yeah, but don't forget that, and oh, but what about these people, and yeah, and that constituency too, it can make the document seem a bit disjointed or haphazard. And I think it's fair to say there's something of that quality to Gaudium et Spes. It has the marks of a committee-driven uh, text, which is part of the um, uh, weakness of it, I think. Uh, just a general um, statement about Vatican II. If you have that lovely two-volume um, set of the magisterial teachings of the church from Nicaea to Vatican II, so all of the major conciliar statements from the uh, uh, fourth century to the present day, you'll notice that Vatican II documents take up fully two-fifths of the two volumes. See, and thereupon hangs a tale. Vatican II is egregious in the history of the church because it's so lengthy. From Nicaea to Vatican I, the church tended to be sort of curt and, and um, uh, canonical and decisive in its statements. Vatican II takes on a much more kind of lyrical and ruminative quality. Now, beautiful in its own way, but there's two problems. One is a lot of people didn't read it because it gets so lengthy, you know? But a second problem was that kind of text opens itself to a whole range of interpretations, more so than, than tightly worded canonical statements. Let's say the Council of Trent or Nicaea. Well, welcome to the last 50 years in many ways, right, as the church's struggle to understand these texts. Well, Gaudium et Spes is the longest and, and uh, uh, most ruminative of these very ruminative texts. Okay. With those introductory remarks, what I'm going to do, everybody, don't worry, I'm not going to plow through the whole text uh, section by section. I want to hit just some uh, highlights as I go. The famous introduction to Gaudium et Spes, I think, is probably the best known uh, passage from all the documents of Vatican II, namely, the joys and hopes and the sorrows and anxieties of people today, especially of those who are poor and afflicted, are also the joys and hopes, sorrows and anxieties of the disciples of Christ. Beautiful, beautiful, lyrical, balanced uh, statement. But let me unpack it a bit theologically, because I think this is where a lot of the debate comes in. What they're arguing here, and now keep in mind, keep in mind, Vatican II is produced by many of these Nouvelle Theologie figures. I mentioned de Lubac, but Danielu comes to mind, Congar, many others, who were recovering very strongly the patristic moment. What did the fathers recover? Go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Prior to the fall, they are in the stance of right praise, which means they are in friendship with God, aligned properly to God. 
And around that central alignment, there grows up a garden. Well, it's symbolic of, the church father said, all that makes human life wonderful and worth living. The garden is philosophy and science and friendship and politics and human relationships and conversation. When the worship of God is central, that's why a place like this, by the way, is so important, where people gather stubbornly in season and out to worship God. That's why Thomas Merton said, you know, when he went to Gethsemane for the first time, I found the still point around which the whole country revolves without knowing it. That's deeply patristic insight. Adam and Eve, so prior to the fall, produce around them this well-ordered society. The church fathers recovered the rabbis who said, the purpose of the human race is now to Edenize the world, is to turn the whole world into a beautiful garden centered around the right praise of God. That means the flourishing of all things human centered on the praise of God. The original sin on this symbolic reading interrupted this vocation. So what did God do? God formed a people Israel and he shaped them according to his own mind and heart. They would think as he thinks, feel as he feels. He taught them how to worship him aright. Again, what's the purpose? that Israel in its right praise would now become the gathering place of the whole world. Mount Zion, true pole of the earth. There all the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. The right praise of Israel would become itself a new Eden. That's why the temple in Jerusalem was decorated with the symbols of the garden. And all the tribes of the world would come there and be Edenized. Israelitized, if you want. Now Israel fell into sin, but there comes at the climax of history the true Israelite, whom Paul importantly named the new Adam, right? The new Adam, the new human. Jesus, the true Israelite, who gives the Father perfect praise, becomes himself the Garden of Eden. What does he gather around himself? He gathers around himself a mystical body, which is his church. And now the church, which Paul calls the new Israel, is meant again to be the magnetic gathering place of the world. All the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. That's the church's mission now, is to Edenize, Israelitize, use Vatican II language now, Christify the world. See, I'm going to argue, everybody, that's Vatican II. Vatican II is not about modernizing the church. Some modernization was called for, yes, indeed. But the purpose of Vatican II was not to modernize the church, it was to Christify the world. That's why the joys and hopes and sorrows and anxieties of the world are the joys and hopes and anxieties of the church, because the church has this transformative mission within the world. That's Vatican II. That's why Cardinal George, who gave the last lecture in this series, has said, Vatican II is best construed as a missionary council. Quite right, it seems to me. A missionary council. That's the beginning of Gaudium et Spes. There's a book that um, Hans Urs von Balthasar wrote. Balthasar, of course, was not at Vatican II for a lot of reasons, but he was very influential at Vatican II through a number of his disciples. He wrote a book in the 50s called Schleifung der Bastionen in his German. It means the knocking down of the bastions. Now, do you see why in light of what I've been describing? Baltar's complaint was the church in all of its richness, theological, spiritual, moral, cultural, was crouching behind walls, crouching behind its own medieval walls, preventing it from flooding the world with Christ's life. Therefore, knock down the bastions in order to Christify the world. That, it seems to me, is Gaudium et Spens. Now, here's where the critics are gonna lock horns with each other. This is where the disagreement comes in. And everybody, I can witness to this. I'm, I know when I told you I, was, I graduated in 1977, you were probably calculating how old is this guy. I'm 53, I'll tell you. I came of age right after Vatican II. So I went to first grade in 1965. I was, my early formation was 60s and 70s. 
of the last century. Making myself sound terribly old. Um, <laughs> how was Vatican II read? At least now, this is my own experience. I think that of a lot of people in my generation. It was read as the modernization of the church. That the world, the modern world, is setting the agenda for the church. That, by the way, was a motto, a slogan of the time when I was a kid. That's a terrible slogan in my judgment. The world does not set the agenda for the church. Rather, the church transfigures the world with Christ. Yes, it goes out to it with love and, and the joys and hopes and anxieties of it are the church's own. Yes, indeed. But it doesn't go, listen, hat in hand to the culture, trying to make ourselves acceptable to the modern culture. Modern culture, like every culture, is evangelically ambiguous. But again, I'll witness to my own um, upbringing. Culture was like a, just a good term when I was a kid. The culture was good, you know? And the church has got to make itself more like the culture. It's got to accommodate itself to the culture. Tell a black person in Alabama circa 1950 that the church's job is to become like the culture. Tell a, tell a, a Jew in Germany of the 30s, you know, that the job of the church is to become like the culture. Our culture, modern culture, good, sure, sure. I can give you a whole lecture on, on the great achievements of modern culture, especially in politics and science. But unambiguously good? Come on. Our abortion on demand culture? Look at the streets of Chicago. I mean, the violence in our culture, the moral drift, the culture of relativism, the dictatorship of relativism, as Benedict XVI put it. No, no, we don't come hat in hand to this deeply ambiguous modern culture seeking to accommodate ourselves. No, no, the church, it's the new Adam, the new Israel, it's Christ's mystical body going out now to transfigure the world. That, it seems to me, is the proper dialogic relationship between the church and the modern world. Here's something from Karl Barth I've always loved. You know, Barth, arguably the greatest Protestant theologian of the last century. And Bart, as a young man, was deeply anti-Catholic. But as an old man, he had mellowed quite a bit, and um, Paul VI invited him to the Vatican II, um, the final sessions. Bart came. Here's this deeply anti-Catholic, at one time, Protestant theologian, who said, if the Holy Spirit's moving anywhere in the Christian world today, it's moving in the Catholic Church. So deeply moved by Vatican II. He came at the end, though, to... Um, uh, an audience with Paul VI, thanked the Pope for the great experience. Then he asked a question, though. He said, Holy Father, when will you know the church is sufficiently updated? Now, he's, he's playing with the term of the time, right? A giornamento, updating. But it was a question with a sting in its tail. He was teasingly asking the Pope, are, are you perhaps allowing the modern world to become the measure of the church and not vice versa? See, I think everybody, that's where the critics are, are locking horns on Gaudium et Spes. I think you can give it a very coherent reading, as I've been suggesting. Coming up out of this patristic um, background, it's about Christifying the world, not so much modernizing the church. Listen to a couple quotes here. The church has the duty in every age of examining the signs of the times and interpreting them in light of the gospel. Again, when I was coming of age, the signs of the times, that was always good. The signs of the times. And the church should get in line with the signs of the times. 23 people killed in the streets of Chicago, that's a sign of the times. How many millions of unborn killed since Roe v. Wade? That's a sign of our time. You know, the moral drift that's everywhere in our culture. Young people being lost, a, a newly aggressive atheism. Those are all signs of the time. Our job is not to accommodate ourselves to those, but rather, again, listen, to read the signs of the times, both good and bad, and interpret them in light of the gospel. The signs of the times are not themselves the data of revelation. They're the data of examination. And the church's job is to read them in light of the gospel and rightly interpret them. That's Gaudium et Spes. Listen to this. It is accordingly in the light of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, that the council proposes to elucidate the mystery of humankind. That's it. That's it. 
I'm going to argue that's de Lubach, that's Danielu, that's Congar, that's Ratzinger. It's not working the other way. See, watch it again. It's in light of Christ, the image of the invisible God, that the council proposes to elucidate the mystery of mankind. That's, I think, the way Gaudium et Spes works. Okay, I'm going to try to watch the time. and There's much we could say, but let me just hit some highlights. That's the general introduction. We now move into chapter one. The first section now of the main body of Gaudium et Spes has to do with human dignity. And it's wonderful because it reads it in a deeply biblical way. It's not reading it along the lines of Hobbes and Locke or Jefferson. It's reading it biblically. Where's human dignity come from? It doesn't come from our own uh, instincts, doesn't come from the culture or the state. Human dignity comes from the fact that we are beloved children of God, that we've been created in God's image and likeness. It's deeply biblical. Now, for those who say God and Spes is too one-sidedly optimistic, take a look at this. They know the image, though real, is severely compromised by sin. Sin which comes from the evil one. I think a very interesting uh, paper, any uh, students out here thinking of a master's thesis or something, write about the devil in Vatican II. Because the devil's mentioned quite a bit in Vatican II. So here, Gaudium et Spes acknowledges the work of the evil one, which has distorted the imago dei in us. So the result is we find in ourselves a dramatic tension between good and evil. Here, Ratzinger comments, it's the influence of Pascal, the great French thinker, who spoke of la grandeur et misère de l'homme, right? The greatness and misery of, of man, of the human. So Gaudium et Spes acknowledges that. You know, we know it from experience and from revelation that we're riven, we're divided. But it gives special attention to the positive side here. Where do you see the imago Dei? Where do you see this image of God in us? And I think everybody, this is based on my work in evangelization, this is very important stuff. It's very important stuff. Because a lot of people in our culture have lost sight of the fact that we are by nature wired for God. Right, as St. Augustine put it. Lord, you've made us for yourself, and therefore our heart is restless till it rests in thee. That's the best and most basic statement of Christian anthropology, isn't it? That's who we are. We're people who are hungry for God. What did Bruce Springsteen say? Everybody's got a hungry heart. Right? <laughs> what did you too say? I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Right? I've, I've, crossed the, I've climbed the highest mountains. I've, I've forged the sea, and I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Um, stay with the rock and roll tradition, I can't get no satisfaction, says Mick Jagger. But I, I don't mean this facetiously. Those are deeply Augustinian impulses. Again, listen to Mick Jagger. I try, I try, and I try, 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 and I can't get no... Well, that's the way the human heart is structured because it's ordered finally to God. And therefore, none of the goods of the world can possibly satisfy us. Listen now to Gaudium et Spens. One special sign of the dignity of the human being is his intellectual power. Now why? The mind, the mind, which is hungry for truth. And it finds it in philosophy, it finds it in the sciences, finds it in all the great academic disciplines. But no matter how much we know, our minds are not satisfied, are they? In fact, the more you know, the more the mind is awakened. Bernard Lonergan, the great Catholic philosopher, said the mind finally wants to know everything about everything. It wants to know being itself. Put it in religious language, it wants the beatific vision. It wants to know the essence of God. It wants to look God in the face. See, but I'm using religious language, but it's something deeply in our experience. We know the restlessness of our own minds. That's the imago Dei in us. It's hard to miss the influence of Karl Rahner's anthropology here. Rahner, Lonergan, both coming out of the same uh, philosophical tradition. Secondly, Gaudium et Spes says, the dignity of, of the human being is, is displayed in conscience. Conscience. That strange voice that tells us right from wrong. That urges us, listen now, with an uncompromising, unconditioned authority what we must do and what we must avoid. What does conscience want? Not just particular goods, not just particular good acts. What the conscience and the will finally want is the good itself. 
the unlimited, unconditioned good. The will, too, witnesses to this holy longing. That's uh, Ron Rollheiser's beautiful phrase. The holy longing, the restless quest for God. Here you can't miss the influence of John Henry Newman, can you? For whom conscience was fundamental. Boy, Newman's disciples are are legion at Vatican II. Uh, Bouillet and and Balthazar and uh, Congar and de Lubac, all deeply influenced by Newman. Ratzinger, too. So here's a very strong influence of Newman. The conscience is part of the imago Dei. Thirdly, Gaudium et Spes says, our own freedom is the imago Dei. It's really important to get this right, and Gaudium et Spes is really clear on it. Freedom is one of those ambiguous terms, because freedom in the modern sense means freedom of indifference or freedom of self-expression, choice. I'm free in the measure that I hover above the yes and no and I can say yes or no. I can decide, I can choose right from wrong, yes from no. It might be modern freedom, it's not biblical freedom. In the Bible, freedom is the disciplining of desire so as to make the achievement of the good first possible and then effortless. Let me unpack that for you. Um, freedom. I'm free. Who was the freest uh, basketball player ever? A lot of us, I had the privilege of seeing him play once or twice. Michael Jordan could do anything the game called for, right? Dribbling was great at it. Three-point shooting, terrific. Two-point shooting, drive the lane, rebounding, defense. He could do it all. He was free because he just chose to play any way he wanted to. Never listened to a teacher, never listened, never watched great masters. No, on the contrary. His desire was disciplined in such a way as to make the achievement of the good first possible, and then in his case, effortless. I stand before you as a relatively free speaker of English. Right? I can say pretty much whatever I want to say in, in English. When I was studying French years ago, and anyone that's wrestle with a foreign language knows this. What I felt above all was unfree. I knew what I wanted to say, but I I just, I felt shackled. I couldn't say it until I submitted myself to a whole set of disciplines, listened to all kinds of masters, read all sorts of books, so that my desire eventually became disciplined to the point where I could speak it relatively freely. That's the freedom that the Bible talks about. It's not a freedom in opposition to the good and to value, but precisely in surrender to it. Listen again to Gaudium et Spes. Genuine freedom is an outstanding manifestation of our ordering to God. See, that's biblical talk. That's Christian talk. Freedom doesn't stand opposed to God, but rather finds itself precisely in relation to God, the supreme good. Now, the next part of this this, uh, first section. You see the influence of Karol Wojtyla, everyone seems to agree. So this young Archbishop of Krakow, who was in the front lines battling atheism, so back in the 1950s and 60s, and Wojtyla suggested they got to talk about atheism. Well, I found this text extraordinarily prophetic and prescient, because now we're dealing in the West with a very aggressive form, the so-called new atheism. And I found this analysis here extremely illuminating. Listen, a a problem of one of the signs of the times, they say, is atheism. What are some of the uh, causes for it? They first point out logical positivism, of course, a philosophical movement in the first part of the 20th century. What I would say in our terms is scientism, not science. But scientism, which means a reduction of knowledge to the scientific mode or form of knowledge. That the only authentic way of knowing is through empirical analysis, experimentation, et cetera, et cetera, scientific method. To reduce all knowledge to that is scientism, or what they call here logical positivism. They also point to an excessive humanism along Feuerbachian lines. Feuerbach, the founder of, of modern atheism who famously said, the no to God is the yes to man. There's atheism in a nutshell, if you want. God is a threat to the human project. He's a threat to human flourishing. 
The more I say nein to God, the more I say ja to my project. That's Feuerbach. Also in Feuerbach, you see it every day on the, on the internet. I, I run into it every day. Religion as a wish-fulfilling fantasy. I make up God because I can't satisfy my own deepest longings. What else do you find? And boy, how contemporary this is. A powerful reaction against evil in the world. The best argument against God. I think at the end of the day, the only one that has real staying power is that one. Is how to reconcile God's existence with the fact of evil. So Gaudium et Spes is, is clearly acknowledging that. And then finally, again, very contemporary. A reaction to corruption and negativity in the church and the bad example of religious people. All four of those that I've just mentioned every day on my internet work I run into. How can I possibly believe in the Catholic Church with this history of crusades and inquisitions and witch hunts and bringing up the date, the sex abuse scandal? Isn't religion just wish-fulfilling fantasy? Doesn't science explain everything? I mean, these, these are very prophetic, very prescient of our own time. Now, what's the answer? They're not going to give you a fully developed answer, but it's a, it's a nice nutshell kind of answer. Gaudium et Spes gives the classic Catholic response. That God must not be construed in a competitive manner. Look in Thomas Aquinas. Thomas does not say that God is the supreme being. Because God's not a being in Aquinas. Not a thing, not a type of existence. He says God's not in any genus, even the genus of being. Extraordinary thing. But we're all in a genus here of humanity, and this is the genus of building and so on. Well, wouldn't God at least be in some kind of genus? How about the genus of being? He must be a being of some kind. No, says Aquinas. Why? Why? Because God is not the supreme being so much. But in his beautiful Latin, ipsum esse subsistence. God is the sheer act of to be itself. The creative ground of the existence of the world. Now see everybody, how I know that sounds like just a lot of logic chopping, but it's a very important point. The supreme being would indeed be in competition with us. If the supreme being comes breaking in, we'd have to give way. Think of the, um, the Greek and Roman myths. When the gods come breaking into human experience, what happens? People are incinerated. <laughs> I mean, things are destroyed because the gods are competing with us. That's so why beware of those books, by the way, that want to bring the, the ancient gods back. I don't want the ancient gods back. I agree with Augustine. I'm glad they're gone, you know. Because now I want you to contrast something. Contrast the Greek and Roman thing, the gods come in and people blow up to the book of Exodus, when Moses sees a bush on fire but not consumed. Hmm, I must go take a closer look at this. And when he does, he hears the voice. What's the name that God gives himself when Moses asks? And, and yeah, right, and the, see the question is a very reasonable one. Well, which, which one are you? You're a God of some kind, obviously. Which one are you? You're God of this place, that place, God of the mountain, God of this people. Which one are you? I am who I am. Thomas Aquinas loved that answer. He loved that answer. I'm not this or that. I'm not this thing rather than that. I'm not here rather than there. Stop asking me stupid questions. See, I don't fit into the categories. <laughs> I am who I am. But see, that corresponds, everybody, to that image of the burning bush. When the true God comes close to the human experience, we are set on fire. We become luminous and radiant, and we are not destroyed. There's the Bible. There's the Bible. And there's our message. Everybody, Christians in this room, that's our message to the world. Believe me, the new atheists, you know, they're disciples, especially among young people. They're thick on the ground today. But we need to be out there with our message. We don't proclaim the message of a supreme being who's competing with human flourishing. No, no. We declare the God of the burning bush. I am who I am. The God who fulfills the deepest longing of the mind and of the heart and of our freedom and lights us on luminous fire and does not destroy us. That's our message. And trust me when I tell you, the world needs to hear it. 
Every day, young people are wrestling with this, precisely this atheism that God has spells name so beautifully. That's why now I've come to the famous 22nd paragraph of God and Spez that, that Carl Wojtyla loved so much and used it in his magisterium over and over again. Here it is, and please read it in light of everything I've been saying about the church, about God, about culture, about, about humanism. Listen to this. In fact, it is only in the mystery of the Word incarnate that light is shed on the mystery of mankind. It is Christ, the new Adam who fully discloses humankind to itself and unfolds its noble calling. Gaudium Spes 22. Uh, if Carl Wojtyla was right, that's the canon within the canon. That's the interpretive grid for this entire document, and I think that's right. And everything I've been saying is just leading up to that. It's in light of the Word made flesh. Now why? Because Jesus is the burning bush. See what I'm driving at? Jesus is humanity, not denigrated, not compromised, not blown up and destroyed, but humanity now at full radiance and luminosity under the influence of divinity. In Jesus, we say in the church, two natures, divine and human, come together without mixing, mingling, or confusion. That's from the Council of Chalcedon. That's burning bush talk. See, I'm driving it. That's burning bush language. The two natures, divinity and humanity, come together but one's not compromised by the other. One is not in competition with the other, but rather the humanity of Jesus becomes the luminous icon of his divinity. And that's the great sign by which we read the signs of the times. That's the great light by which the church illumines and understands the culture. That's the lumen meant to be brought to the Gentiles. See, that's Gaudium et Spes 22, and it sums up this rich uh, humanism. Um, that's, that's a wonderful opening. The first half of Gaudium et Spes is some of these themes. Beautiful. Please read it prayerfully. And, and if the church could find this fire again, we'd set the world on fire. See, the trouble is, I'm going to editorialize here, but in the years I was coming of age, we turned in. This is Pope Francis too, by the way, I think. We turned in. And we fought with ourselves, largely over sex and authority. I'm not saying they're bad questions, they're good questions, and good people debated them. But that wasn't Vatican II. It wasn't the church turned in fighting with itself. It was the church turning with an with a illuminating confidence with this great message. And man, does the world need it. End of editorial. Part two, I'll just mention a couple things. It calls it some urgent problem. So as the council fathers looked at the scene in 1965, here's what they saw. The first one, marriage and family. By the way, if you want to understand the magisterium of John Paul II, read the second part of Gaudium et Spes. Point by point by point, that's John Paul II's magisterium. So what was he uh, almost obsessed with? The theology of the body and marriage, right? There it is, first point. Here is Gaudium et Spes. The family exists as an image and symbol of the divine love in the world. Now, that's old biblical stuff. It goes back to St. Paul. I'll just shed a little light on it this way. When I was in full-time parish work, I prepared a lot of couples for marriage. And um, I would invariably ask them eventually, after we got to know each other, well, why do you want to get married in church? You know? And the answer would come back after some hemming and hawing, well, we love each other. And I would say, well, that's great. I'm delighted you love each other. <laughs> that's no good reason to get married in church. I mean, people in love can get married under the stars and they can get married uh, in just the peace. Why do you get married in church? Because marriage in the church is meant to be a sign and symbol of the divine love in the world. In other words, marriage in the church becomes ingredient in God's overarching purpose. Your life is not about you. It's one of the great spiritual paths in the spiritual masters. Your life is not about you. Get married in church if you say, we believe we've been brought together by the divine love to be a radiant sign of the divine love to the world. Our marriage is now ingredient in God's great purpose. Good. Now get up in front of God and his people and pledge your love to each other. Well, that's Gaudium et Spens. How about this now? Children are the supreme gift of a marriage. 
Catholic couples should procreate with generous and Christian responsibility. And Godwin Spes insists, listen, special recognition should be accorded those who prudently and jointly decide to have a large family. Um, did you see the Time cover story a month ago about the child-free life? Did you see that? <laughs> the cover gave the whole game away. It was this, you know, young, fit a couple, uh, and they're lounging languidly on the beach, and they're gazing up at the camera with blissful smiles, no child anywhere in sight. And the article was arguing, not only is this increasingly the case in America, our birth rate, by the way, is lowest in recorded history right now. E even outpacing the, um, the crisis after the Great Depression, there was a huge crash in, in uh, ferti not fertility, but in, in uh, um, reproduction. It's worse than that today. Well, here's Gaudium et Spes, calling Catholics, couples, to be signs of divine love in the world. And one of those signs is fecundity, go forth and multiply. Giving life is one of the signs. Of course, something that was very new in Gaudium et Spes, we're used to it now 50 years later, but it was revolutionary for the time, that adding to having children, this great idea. The very nature of an unbreakable covenant between persons and the good of the offspring demand that the mutual love of the partners should be rightly expressed and should develop and mature. Again, we take it for granted, but that was pretty revolutionary 50 years ago, that one of the principal ends and purposes of marriage is the mutual love and support of the uh, husband and wife. Let me say a really quick thing now about culture, which is the second one. Again, John Paul II's magisterium, family, body, now culture central to his magisterium. Gaudium Spes says, a healthy culture is predicated upon the faith. Now why, why? Because every culture, it argues, is animated by the three great transcendental drives of the human spirit. I mean toward the true, toward the good, and toward the beautiful. Truth, right? A culture is predicated upon this drive for truth. Think of newspapers, think of the universities, think of education, think of, of books. All of it is reflective of the human desire for truth. How about the good? Well, think of all of our legal structures. Think of the judicial system, trying to establish justice and righteousness. The beautiful. Now think of everything from painting and sculpture to dance and theater and television and even the internet, I suppose, to some degree, is attempt to achieve the beautiful. Good. That's culture. Now, a healthy culture, Gaudium et Spes argues, must be predicated upon the faith. Why? Because we heard earlier the imago dei is a drive toward the true and the good and the beautiful in their unconditioned form. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. What makes a culture sick? Boy, boy are they right on target here. They're reflecting the great Catholic tradition and they are very prophetic of the present moment. What makes a culture sick is when the transcendent dimension is shut down and now the drive for infinite truth turns in on itself, fussing with the particular truths that we can know. There's scientism. It devolves even further, by the way. The drive for the good, when the transcendent dimension is denied, turns in on itself. Augustine said, curvatus in se, caved in on itself. The drive for the beautiful, when it's severed from the transcendent referent, devolves into kind of a kitschy preoccupation with surface prettiness. What makes culture alive is that beautiful and alluring transcendent dimension. And Newman saw this. Boy, Newman saw it. It makes science more itself. It, it makes literature more itself. It makes the law and justice more themselves when they are ordered to something that transcends their finite reach. That's Gaudium et Spes. See, and again, everybody, look, that's our job in this culture is to keep speaking of the transcendent. It's this building speaks of it, right? Our, our lives, our, our, our moves, our, our lives have to speak of it. The transcendent. Just a last one now about um, social and political life, but I think it's a really central way to name what's at the heart of a Catholic social teaching. Listen now to Gaudium et Spes. 
Economic progress ought to remain within the control of the people and not be committed to the sole decision of a few or of groups possessing too much economic power or political power. Now, I love that line because it's a real good summary line of Catholic social teaching, which as I read it from, from uh, Rerum Navarum, late 19th century, all the way through to Benedict XVI, says above all this, power both economic and political should be widely spread throughout the society and not concentrated in a few hands. There's Catholic social teaching. Political power, don't concentrate it in the hands of a dictator. Don't concentrate it in the hands of a particular family. Don't concentrate it in the hands of a communist party. Allow political power to be widely diffuse through the society. Economic power, the same thing. Don't allow it to become, in a sort of oligarchic way, gathered in a few hands. Think here of John Paul II's magisterium on profit making. What's good about profit making? Well, if someone's making a lot of profit, it should signal to other people in the economy, hey, there's money to be made there. I should get involved in that. I'll form my own business. I'll get into that game. Good. It spreads the wealth around. If someone is extraordinarily wealthy, what are they called to do? Invest that money creatively. Don't concentrate it in a few hands. Rather, invest it creatively. Give it away. What this does, everybody, is it allows at the same time the two great sub-principles, namely subsidiarity and solidarity, to express themselves. Now, that's a lecture for another night. But I think Gaudium Spes beautifully sums it up there. Economic progress ought to remain within the control of the people and not be committed to the sole decision of a few or groups possessing too much economic or political power. That's a wonderful uh, summary statement. Okay, I promise I'll stop. So let me just um, give you a couple closing remarks here. I, I hope you get the impression I I'm running through the second section. I apologize for that. There's a lot of richness there. But the real power of this statement of Gaudium et Spes is in the first part. I think where these great biblical and anthropological and theological truths are named. The second part on these individual issues, we can debate, and people of goodwill can debate them, you know, beyond the principles level. But that first part is so powerful. Here's a few closing remarks. Do I think Gaudium et Spes is the canon within the canon? That's to say the interpretive lens by which the other documents should be read. My answer is no. My answer is, I think we should pay attention to what the fathers themselves said in naming the four great constitutions. They named two as dogmatic constitutions. First of all, Dei Verbum, the Word of God. What's the Word of God but the Bible concentrated and incarnated fully in Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, who's the light of the world. Christ is the, de, is the Dei Verbum. He is the Word of God made flesh. That's the Word that's meant to go out and transfigure the world. That's why Dei Verbum leads ineluctably to Lumen Gentium. Who is the church? All of us, the mystical body. We are that mystical body meant to carry the Lumen or the Dei Verbum now out to the world. Read Lumen Gentium. What is the church? Then I would say, in light of Lumen Gentium, read Gaudium et Spes. Gaudium et Spes now is, well, what does it look like when that Lumen is brought out to the wider world? So I would suggest some of the trouble after Vatican II, some of the confusion might have been avoided if Gaudium et Spes had not been given such a prominent place. I think if Dei Verbum and Lumen Gentium come first, then we'll properly read this document and allow it to be unleashed in all of its genuine power. God bless you all. Thanks for listening tonight.